heard this thing cut on in the middle of that song. Don't worry, I stopped singing. It is good to be with you here tonight. Uh, I do want to mention, uh, I was talking with Larry out, out front before uh, services started, and I didn't mention this to Tim, I should have, uh, but they asked just uh, just for a couple of few days till Wednesday night, maybe till we hear, uh, hear something. Uh, no visitors for Miss Anna, just as she gets her strength back and everything. And so, uh, but of course they welcome the prayers, and uh, prayers have been answered. That's, he sent me a message this afternoon that said that, that she was getting to go to... Uh, uh, to a room and the, the t uh, ventilator of course came out yesterday but she was getting to, to go to a normal room and so that was uh, definitely answered prayers and, and right there we, I was driving the bus uh, to pick up Danny and Robert and I just I, I praised God and, and, and gave him thanks for, uh, for her healing and just continue to, to pray for that good family. Uh, Anton von Leeuwenhoek uh, from the Dutch Netherlands. Uh, no one but Joseph Gray might know who he is. Anton von Leeuwenhoek, Robert Cook, and Zacharias Jensen. Uh, those three guys are credited with the first three main people, uh, and Joseph knows this because he's in seventh grade science and that's what I teach. Uh, those are th three of the first guys to use the microscope. And um, Robert Hook was one of the first to look at a plant. It was a cork. He had take a cross section of a cork and look at that cork under a microscope. And what he realized was that it wasn't just cork. It was made up of tiny little boxes. And those little boxes they later realized were plant cells. And so Robert Hooke did that. Um, Anton von Leeuwenhoek, there was a man that had never brushed his teeth once. And this was in like 1625, 1623, somewhere around there. And uh, a man that had never brushed his teeth ever. And uh, that's how science is, getting dirty. And so he takes a swab of this guy's mouth and looks at whatever was in his mouth at the time under a microscope. And he discovered bacteria. And uh, probably a lot of bacteria in that guy's mouth. Anyways, and uh, so all of these things that they're looking at, uh, Von Leeuwenhoek, when he looked at it under a microscope, it magnified what he was looking at 270 times. And now the twin Keck uh, telescopes that are uh, in Hawaii, they magnify what millions or hundreds of thousands of times, making something bigger. But what doesn't change and what we have to realize is, is the matter, the atom, or whatever it is that they're looking at under the electron microscope or telescope, whatever it is, whatever they're looking at, the object they're that they're looking at, does it change the size of that? Is the object actually getting any bigger? No, it's not. But it's the perspective of what they're seeing is changing. Guys, tonight, uh, what I want to look at is Mary's Magnificat. And we'll use this and hopefully it'll go. If you still got your Bibles, go to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be looking at tonight at making God bigger in our lives. Now in saying that, does that mean that God actually changes? Does that mean that you're going to make Him bigger? Absolutely not. You can't make Him bigger. He's the biggest thing there is. He's everywhere. He's everything. We're not going to make Him bigger. But what we're going to do is we're going to get that microscope and we're going to hand it to those people that we work with. We're going to get that telescope and the people that live in our neighborhood. We're going to give it to them so that when they look at our lives, they're going to see God and they're not going to see just this God that you talk about on Sunday and Wednesdays, but they're going to see this mega huge God in our lives every single day. And we're going to use Mary's Magnificat, her, her song of praise there, to do that. And so we'll just go through, you'll kind of judge how long the lesson's going to be because we're going to look at each one of these verses and just spend maybe one or two, three, five minutes on the first one, so that won't be a good judge. Um, but a few, a few minutes on each of these verses, and then the lesson will be yours. And hopefully every time that, I don't think I've ever heard a lesson about this, and probably Probably when you heard uh, Marty's reading, you were thinking, does he know it's not Christmas time? Um, but, you know, I don't know if I've ever heard a lesson about this. And so we're going to be making God big in our lives so that others can see him. And so we're getting into that. So let's start reading. Uh, Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 46. Mary's song of praise. Maybe this will work. There we go. All right. Verse 46. And it simply starts out, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And there is an absolutely beautiful song. If you're having... This song has been in, in my head probably for the past month or so. Uh, we used this passage uh, to draw some points in our class about a month or so ago um, in our Sunday morning class. And since then, I was listening to the song on YouTube. And since then, the song... It's a four-part harmony song where the uh, parts sing different times and come in differently. And... and 
and it's it's a pretty tough one to sing, but uh, we sing it some at school, and then the kids sing it at their devotionals, and I'm sure they sing it at CYC. But anyways, it is it is a beautiful song. If you're ever having a bad day at work, just get uh, get online and, and get on YouTube and and watch that video, listen to that song. It is absolutely beautiful. But that's how the song starts. It's simply my soul magnifies the Lord. That word magnify means to make great, to make something big, to make it conspicuous. You know, inconspicuous is you don't want to fit in. Okay, that's middle schoolers. They don't want to fit in, uh, or, or they, they don't want to stand out. Rather, they just want to fit in. They don't want to be noticed. Uh, they, they they don't they want to wear what everybody else is wearing and do what everybody else is doing. And then at some point when they get in the high school, they're like, I want to be different, and I want to cut all my hair off or get a uh, an earring at the top or something. A anyways. But what this word means to magnify, it means to make conspicuous, to notice, okay? Someone comes in here with, uh, you know, with bright blue hair, they're going to be conspicuous. You're going to say, your hair was blonde this morning and it is now blue, okay? Um, you're, that's conspicuous. You notice something like that, okay? So that's what you're doing to God. That's what Mary's saying is that she is magnifying God to esteem highly, to laud, to celebrate them. Now, why in the world, what does Mary have to celebrate about? Well, what was what the context of this is what Marty read earlier. If you didn't catch that, she's talking with Elizabeth. She, she's going and Elizabeth is meeting with her. And they're just talking about how awesome it is that she is going to give birth to the Messiah. And she says, God is so awesome that I have to pause right now in my life and give him praise. And guys, I don't know if I ever have done that more than in the past year and a half in my life. And there'll be times where I'm playing with the boys at the house. Or the other day we, we had Benny out in the snow. And I'm looking at this kid and I'm thinking, there is absolutely no way that people can believe that God doesn't exist. And I look at these awesome boys that God's blessed me with and I think, how can people think that God didn't create them? That God didn't create this world? And it really, I, I don't understand. I know that people go through hard times in their life and they might doubt, but, but then you look at the great things that God has. In teaching science, and in sixth grade I teach earth science, and we talk about how, just how intricate and how delicate the world is, how God made the world exactly the, the correct amount of time, the correct amount of distance from the, sur from the sun to keep the earth's surface a, a certain temperature. He placed the exact amount of radioactive elements inside of earth's core so that we can have heat both from the center of the earth and heat coming from radiant energy coming from the sun. And then, and my kids are studying this, and then I'll just kind of play devil's advocate and I'll say, and now all that's just by chance, right? It just happened that that, that's it. And of course, they're, no, no, no way, you know, God's, you know, bigger than the boogeyman. And, and they tell me all this stuff and, and, and it's true. And so Mary just pauses right here and she just says, God, you are awesome. I put you above every single person. And, and we've seen this throughout the Old Testament, throughout, throughout the Bible. In Exodus chapter 15, you have them crossing the Red Sea and the waters literally part and they walk across dry land, something that we would never be able to witness today apart from God doing that. And what does Miriam do after that happens? She pauses in Exodus chapter 15 and it's basically like a Disney movie where people are walking around and talking and then all of a sudden there's just a song. And, and I really think that the Holy Spirit has came into Miriam at this point and has given her, given her something to be excited about. And so she has that song of praise in Exodus chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Okay, Hannah, Samuel's mother, uh, who they're, they're not able to have children. Hannah is, is going to be given this child and of course she has to give it back to the temple for him to one day be a priest but Hannah is so excited that she's promised this child what does she do in verses 1 through 10 of 1 Samuel 2 she sings a praise a song of praise to God Genesis chapter 12 not a song of praise but but you have here in, in, in Genesis chapter 12, God comes to Abraham and sets up this covenant promise with Abraham. And he says, uh, your descendants will be as the, as the sand on the seashore, as the, as the stars in the sky. And Abraham's thinking, I am super old and my wife is really old too. I'm not sure how this is going to happen. But God promises him that. And, and he is so excited. What does he do? He builds an altar. Why? To praise God, to worship him up in our life. So what do we take from this? We look at our lives and we say, okay, what am I doing so that others will see the altar that I have built up for God. So that, because that's why they did it when they would pass by those altars. They would say, hey, why is this bunch of rocks right here? And then their grandparents or their parents would say, that's there because, you know, our great granddad or our great super uncle, they say, God made a covenant with him, a promise with him. And now I'm going to teach you about that. And I'm going to teach you why we're God's people. 
What is it in our life that we're stopping and we're saying, I magnify you, God? What is it that people around us see that we're making God bigger? in our lives so they can see Him in us. In the New Testament, in the first century, uh, in Acts chapter 5, we see uh, a lot of times we focus on the bad in Acts chapter 5 with the evil couple there, Ananias and Sapphira. But the whole point of Acts chapter 5 is that people are selling their possessions. They're, they're in this community to where they're selling what they have so that they can help the needy. And we've been able to do that some recently. Acts chapter 17, the Philippian jailer is converted to be a Christian. What does he do? He changes his life. Do you think he goes back to that prison and works again? There's not a chance. He converts his, uh, his, his family is converted. And what is he doing? He's magnifying God, not by building altars or breaking out in song in the middle of the work day, but by his actions. So guys, it's simple to see. Magnify God with our actions. There's example after example of people praising. Think of David's writing all through the Old Testament of him lifting up God so that others can read. Example after example of people showing how big God can be in their lives and sharing Him with others. I told you the first verse was my favorite, so that's what I was going to spend the most time on. Alright, moving on. Verse 46, simply, my soul magnifies the Lord. Verse 47. That's still 46. Verse 47, uh, after Mary says, My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. This is what happens when you magnify God in your life. When you make God mega big in your life, you're going to rejoice in that. Translated literally what this means is that there is much leaping. This is the same word that's used um, in Acts chapter 3 when the crippled man is cured and he, was, he leapt up because he was so excited about it. It's the same word that's used here in John chapter 4 uh, at verse 14 that I don't have wrote down so I'm going to read it. Uh, Whoever drinks of the water that I will give to him will never be thirsty again. This water that I give to him will be a spring of water water welling up to eternal life. That spring of water that's, that's bubbling up, that's welling up, that's what this word means, to rejoice, to bubble up, to be so excited, to, to leap for joy. She was excited. Why was she excited? She was about to give birth to the Messiah. What more could a lady be excited about? Someone who, was she of, of noble birth? Did she have, I mean, there really wasn't anything that exciting about her. Until what? Until God came into her life. And then there was something to be excited about. Verse 48. There we go. Uh, verse 48. Uh, so why are you excited? Why is she excited? My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Why? For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. There's a whole lot of people... I don't know if more people now in the world know about Mary than don't know about her. But if people that know Christianity, they would definitely say that she's blessed. Definitely say that, that God did some, had done something great with her life. It says, He has looked on the humble estate of His servant. The humble estate. The New Living Translation, it says, translates that, For He took notice of this lowly servant girl. Guys, for God to appear big in our life... We have to appear small. What does Paul say? The less there is of me, the what? More of God that people can see. And so what we have to do is we have to break ourselves down so God can be built up in our life. He who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Matthew 23, verse 12. All throughout the Bible. If you were to take any example in the Bible, Paul is about the only person. I, I was sitting there thinking about this earlier today, and I was trying to think of just someone in the Bible that was just awesome before God got them. And what, by awesome, Paul definitely wasn't awesome. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, that had high status. Status that was, you know, kind of, he ruled the roost, king of the crop, you know, uh, cream of the crop, rather. But, you know, people just knew who they were. Paul was about the only one. But even at that, was he not kind of at the bottom because he was persecuting Christians? But anyways, think back to the Old Testament. All throughout the Bible, God chooses the lowly to build them up, to esteem him. He used tent makers. He used shepherds. He used fishermen, etc. Why? So that they wouldn't make a name for themselves, but that they could show how powerful God was. Think about Acts chapter 2. If you'll turn in Bibles to Acts chapter 2. 
Uh, you have in, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascends, but before he ascends, in Matthew chapter 16, he, he had promised the keys to the kingdom. That kingdom of, of God was the kingdom, the earthly kingdom, uh, the church. He promised those to Peter. And so in Acts chapter 2, Peter starts preaching this sermon. But it's, it's, it's before he starts preaching, you see that the, the Holy Spirit descends and it's like tongues of fire. And, and it, it's a big to-do, all right? There's like a sound that's like a mighty rushing wind. And then what do all the disciples start doing? They all start speaking in different languages, right? One speaking in this language because remember it's the day of Pentecost. So there's Jews from here, there's Jews from here, from here, from here, from here. Okay, and they're all coming and they speak different dialects. And so... The disciples are speaking and everyone can understand them. And they're like, whoa, this is, this is weird, you know. They say, these men, they, there's no way they could know these. Why? Because they are unlearned. Unlearned Galileans, okay? And so if God would have used someone of high esteem that, that had all this education, all this background, then the people around them could have been like, oh, no, 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 they, you know, they went to the school of so-and-so and studied with so-and-so. They, they just know all these languages. But God used them so that people would know. No, it's not just that they're, they're unlearned Galileans. People thought that they were even drunk, that they were just talking gibberish, but that didn't make sense because they understood what they were saying. Okay, it wasn't like people speaking in tongues that, um, that kind of happens now the charismatic church where they're just talking and no one understands. But people understood what they were saying to show God's power. Why? God esteems the humble. Okay, these guys didn't think anything of themselves but only thought of God's power. Matthew chapter 23 verse 12, like I said earlier, he who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. Repeated again in Luke chapter 18 verse 14. James 4.10 and 1 Peter 5.6. All God lifts up those who bring themselves low. Verse 49. Alright, so he looked to the humble estate of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed. Of course, God lifting her up. Verse 49. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. She keeps perspective that it's not her that's doing something great. It's he who is mighty has done great things for me. She keeps perspective that God is the one who is doing things for her. When we have this mega God in our life and people can see him living in us, we realize that it's not the blessings that we're getting. Okay, it's nothing that I'm doing that I deserve these, but because you're keeping God first in your life, the blessings are coming from living that life, from having that humility. You understand that it's not you that's earning all these things, but it's God that's blessing you with those. And when you don't have that, I earned it, it's mine, I deserve it, that sense of entitlement that you might see in, in people around you and in, in the kids that you teach, maybe. I see that sometimes. Um, but when you... When you when you deserve something and you feel like you're entitled to that, do you appreciate it? Some of you are like, show of hands if you want to participate. How many of you bought your first car? You bought it. It wasn't given to you. Keith raised his hand. Keith probably built it. What am I talking about? Um, you bought your first car. Did you take care of that car? Think about it. Uh, or did you just think, ah, I'll just do whatever because mom and dad will buy me a new one if I wreck it? Uh, no. No, I didn't see a lot of kids raising their hands. What's going on? No, because you, cause you, you earned it, okay? You worked hard for it. But if you just think, I deserve this, you don't care for it as much. You see, there's nothing that Mary could have done to deserve being Jesus' mom, to be the mother of the Messiah, okay? She didn't earn that. But God blessed her with it. And so, uh, if you don't have that sense, again, if you don't have that sense of entitlement, of God deserve, I, you know, I deserve this from God, God should give me this, but you're living your life and He's blessing you, that's when things start making sense. That's when, when, the, when she, is, she is saying, God is a holy God and He is blessing me because I'm staying humble. Look at this on the, what I have on the screen. Uh, Psalm chapter 112. The 112th Psalm. And this is great. Again, we're getting into kind of the, the mind of David here with this reading. Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. 
who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house. His righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks at triumph on his adversaries. He has disputed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. With a healthy fear of the Lord, you realize that it's the Lord that does great things for you, not you that do them for yourself. Verse 50. And His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. Mercy. Not getting what we deserve. It's different than grace. Grace is getting something that you don't deserve. Okay? If I were to walk down to Alec and I said, Alec, here's a $100 bill. I don't have one. Sorry, bud. But this is a $100 bill. This is for you. Alec didn't do anything to deserve it. I'm just giving it to you because I am gracious. Okay? Different story. Alec does something to get in trouble at home. His mom says, Alec, you shouldn't have done this. You're going to get punished. And Alec says, no, mom, please have mercy. Because he deserves to get punished, but he's asking for mercy, okay? And he's saying, please don't punish me. That's what we deserve. Because of our sin, we deserve that punishment. But what God is, is God is merciful. Did we deserve the cross? Did we deserve that? No. See, the cross is given, Jesus is given on the cross because of grace. And that's one hand. That's great. That's awesome. On the other hand, mercy, what do we deserve because of our sin? We deserve punishment. But because of His mercy, we're not getting that punishment that we do deserve. His mercy is only for those that fear Him from generation to generation. So again, having that fear of God and knowing that He is blessing us. Verse 51. <coughs> Verse 51, He has shown strength with His arm. That's God's strength. That's God's power. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their own hearts. Alright, this is, this is big. This is uh, Matt Chandler um, who wrote the book, Philippians, To Live is uh, Christ, To Die is Gain. And that's what we're studying in our uh, Sunday morning class. Um, he really goes into some detail on this verse. And I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on verse 51. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. We're going to focus on the second half of this. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. Another translation of that would be, He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their own minds. Because that heart there is, is, is the mind, your inwardmost being. What that means is that if you are so proud that you think that I have done all of this, again, this is in so much of a contrast to this humble, lowly Mary who just says, God, thank you for giving me this opportunity and I praise you for being so awesome. In contrast with this proud, maybe Pharisee that stands and says, well, I've kept all of these laws. I've done all of this. I have been circumcised, kind of the, 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 the thing Paul does with a Pharisee among Pharisees, you know. And they're saying, I'm proud. I'm proud because I have done all of this and they're, they're singing the, to the tune of that me, 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 me over and over. And you're like, come on, man. The proud, what can God do for that person? That he thinks that, or she thinks that they have done everything themselves. Can God change them? Does that mean that we should just give up on them? Well, God's not going to magically come and, and take a wand and say, you are now humble. Boom. That's not how it works. It says that the proud God has scattered in their own imaginations. Meaning this, uh, that, that the Greek word actually means um, through their own minds, to, to an unreasonable mind rather. It's, 
Have you ever had a conversation with someone? Me and Whitney were talking about this this afternoon because I wanted to, to check that it makes sense. And this was while the kids were asleep, so she said it did make sense without someone screaming and crying or running up to us. So anyways, you, you talk with someone, you have a pretty good conversation with them, and, and, and you're listening and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're following them with them and, and, and they just turn the page and start talking about something you have no clue what's going on. And, and you end the conversation with them and they walk away and you wonder in your mind, you say, what world are they living in? Have you ever said that? I need some head nods because me and Whitney both have thought that before. But, okay, there we go. All right. If no one else, Mel Butler says that about y'all. No. Um, you know, what world are they living in? Like, you, they think that everything revolves around them or they just have a completely misunderstanding of something? They're just like a, a gross misinterpretation of something and they think that, like... Paying your taxes means like paying sales tax and you don't actually have to pay income tax or something like that. What world are they living in? You don't have to pay taxes. So anyways, that's what this means. It means that God has given them the choice again. He doesn't make them do this, but he gives them that free will choice to where if they are so proud that they're living in this world where basically everything revolves around who? Revolves around them. How big does God seem in that person's life? Not very big, does it? Okay, uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 1, 21 through 24. Romans chapter 1, 21 through 24. And Paul gives some uh, insight here, writing to the church at Rome. Remember, Rome, probably going to have a lot of money there, a lot of things going on. 21 through 24. Talking about God's wrath. For although, this is Romans 1, 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. Does that sound like someone humble? I don't think so. Did not give thanks to Him, but became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, and so on and so forth. God gave them up. God doesn't give up on them, but again, He let them choose. And, and you get, you know, this is those kind of people that, that you're talking to, and, and you get done talking to them, and you're like, hey man, it's your world, we're just living in it. You know, that everything revolves around them. They're so proud because of all the things that they have done. When you're living in this prideful manner, and you don't show how big God can be in your life, you're simply living for yourself. When you're stuck in the imagination of your own heart, you can never deal with your own sin because it's always someone else's fault, right? You've talked to these people. Oh, it's so-and-so's fault that this is going on. It's so-and-so's fault that this is going on. And they never realize that, that they need to own up that maybe some of the fault lies within themselves, okay? Matt Chandler says this in his book, Philippians, To Live is Christ, To Die is Gain. We turn ourselves into martyrs. And all along, we're never able to recognize that we're the culprit in our own sin or our own responsibility to love, to forgive, and to strive to be at peace with others. I'm waiting for them to come apologize to me. You know, it's their fault. It's just, you're always, you know, it's always someone else's fault. Well, guys, on Judgment Day, are you going to be able to say, oh, it's so-and-so's fault that I hadn't been to, to a worship service in 10 years. Oh, it's so-and-so's fault. You're not going to be able to stand with anyone. It's just going to be you and your maker. When you're that called up and you have that much pride, God's not going to seem very big in your life. And what we're wanting to do is make others see that big, huge God to magnify God in our lives. Verse 52. Verses 52 and 53 uh, both kind of follow along the, the same of what we talked about in verse 48. We'll go through them quickly in just talking about making God big in our lives, humbling ourselves. Uh, here's verse 52. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones, exalted those of humble estate. And I won't be the dead horse, just uh, uh, hit on a few verses here. Proverbs, and if you want to write these down, that's fine, but I'll just read through them quickly. Proverbs 6, 16, God hates the haughty eyes. Proverbs 8, 13, pride and arrogance are things that God hates. Proverbs 16, 5, everyone who is arrogant. By the way, if you have a teenage son or you know some teenage boys, uh, write these verses down. Proverbs 16, 5, everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. And then James 4, 6, God opposes the proud. All right. 
There's a lot of things that I don't want to happen to me, but I don't want God to oppose me. I want to be on His team. I don't want to be on the opposite side of God. And who does He oppose? He opposes the proud. Why? Because God can't do anything with someone that thinks they do everything themselves. God needs someone humble. God needs someone of a contrite heart, just like Mary. Why did He use Mary? Because it wasn't anything that she did, but it was God's actions through her. Uh, verse 53, He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. Okay, those rich people get sent away empty, but they don't think that they're empty, right? Because they have all the stuff. They have all these possessions, and they spend all this time getting stuff so that they can buy more things, so that they can, when they get those things, they'll feel good about themselves, right? But then they need that promotion to pay for all these things. So when they get that promotion, everything will be fine. But then they get that promotion and everybody on this floor, everybody in this office, they have these things. So then they have to buy those things and it just goes on and on. And what does, what does Solomon say about that? Uh, look at... Whoop, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, Matthew 5, 6, real quick. Uh, Matthew 5, 6... Uh, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be satisfied. Okay, it's not about it's not about possessions. It's about hunger, being hungry and thirsting for God. And when you do that, see, then you're filled up. You don't have this void, this hole in your life. Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. God gave Jesus up for all of us. But the verse doesn't end there. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And a lot of people construe this verse with Romans 8.32. He's going to give us all things. That means if I pray to God, he'll give me a new truck, a new transmission, and some new tires less. Is that how that works out? No. Not going to give you all things. He's going to give you all things that matter. Yes, he will. And when will that be? Will it be today? Might not be today. Might be in the promised land. It might be that we have to wait that long. Okay? So the rich. Uh, in in the, the videos that we're watching on Sunday morning where I got a lot of these ideas for him for this lesson, um, he mentions in the book that goes along with it that he kind of feels bad for the rich people because in the Bible it's just always, I mean, it's this hard to get to heaven if you're rich. It's this hard to do this if you're rich. And then, you know, the people that go out and they have, you know, the, the brand new cars because they've saved and they're able to get that. We shouldn't be mad at those people, okay? That's, that's not what he means. It means rich and that's all they're focused on because how did they get to be rich because God blessed them again with Mary or is it because they've done all of it themselves that's that's the pride that we're trying to avoid constantly wanting more more and more that I'll get this and I'll get that this guy that's just so proud of what he's done Ecclesiastes 1 chapter 14 and eight more times does Solomon use this verse this word to strive after the wind all right? You're not going to catch it. You're just going to keep going. I remember one time on America's Funniest Home Video watching this little kid, and I, I love that show, um, but watching this little kid trying to chase his shadow, all right, running around trying to catch the shadow. It, it, they're never going to catch it. It's not there. I mean, it's, it's just shadow. <laughs> And that's what these rich people are doing. That's what these, these people that are so proud, they're, they're, they're striving after something that they're never going to catch. Hosea mentions this in his prophecy in Hosea chapter 12, that the nation of Ephraim is just, they're striving after the wind. They're focused on all these things that don't matter, and they're never going to get them. They're never going to get them. And if you're so focused on these things, now I'm not saying that having these things are bad. No, not at all. But when you're so focused on those, that those things seem big and God seems small. People aren't seeing God in your life. And then we'll end these uh, last two verses, 54 and 55. We won't spend much time on those. Just read through them. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And then verse 55. He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Those last two verses. Verse 54. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. Guys, his servant Israel, we are that new Israel. Christians today are God's new nation here on earth. And as he spoke to our fathers, to the Abraham, and to his offsprings forever. Who's Abraham's offspring now? It's the church. That's the, that's the stars of the sky, the sands on the seashore. It's the church. It's the lineage of the spiritual nation. And God still talks to us. That's a promise to us. God speaking directly to us and saying, I will speak with them forever. Now, does He come and talk to us in the middle of the night like He did to the priests, like He did to the prophets? No. How does He do it? 
Matthew chapter, or, or John chapter 14 rather, and then I put a couple of, a uh, few verses there, 15, 16. Jesus, when he was leaving the earth, he was talking to his apostles, his followers there, and he said, you're not going to be by yourself, that I'm going to send someone that's going to, or something rather, that's going to help, that's going to give you the words that you need to say, that's going to give you the strength when you need the strength, that's going to be with you all the time. And that's the comforter, that's the helper, and that's God's spirit. Because we have God's spirit today. And a lot of times, we're scared to, to open ourselves up to that spirit. We're scared, scared to get into God's word because you might read some things you don't like. You might see that maybe you're being a little too proud and you need to be taken down a notch in God's word. But you've got to open yourself up to it. If you're going to listen to God, if you're going to have that humble and contrite heart, if you're going to make God mega big in your life so that people can see him living in you, just like Mary. Oh man, just like Mary. That her soul magnifies God. This week, let's take opportunity. Let's look for ways to magnify God. Let's look for ways around us to just stop and say, God, I praise you for being awesome. You are a mighty God. There's no way that I could do this by myself, but because you've blessed me with all all these with all these things, with all these blessings, I lift your name up above all other names on earth. And it may be that you're living that proud life tonight that you want to turn around and you're going to say a prayer right there in the pew and that's great. Or it might be that you want some help from the congregation or you want to put on Christ and, and humble yourself so that He can lift you up. If we can assist you in any way tonight, whether it's to repent of sin or to become a New Testament Christian, come now as we stand and sing the song of invitation. In the house of